everyone. So far, as we've considered the Westminster Confession of Faith, we have seen what it has to say about the Bible, which is the Word of God, and is the authority for everything else that will follow. And we have considered what it tells us about the nature and attributes of God himself. We've seen that not only is God the creator of all things, he has a plan and purpose for his creation. Indeed, he is directing all things to their ultimate purpose, which is his glory. Well, having focused on God, the confession changes direction and now puts humanity under the microscope, particularly humanity's fall into sin and the breach in our relationship with God. It then moves on to God's plan of salvation through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And later on, the confession will go on to talk about what it means to be redeemed by Christ and the wider implications of Christianity for the church and for society in general. Okay, but at chapter 6, let's just see what it has to say. It's entitled, Of the Fall of Man, of Sin, and of the Punishment Thereof. This chapter tells us the sad story of the fall of humanity, and then details the grim realities of sin and judgment. This is what section 1 says. Our first parents, being seduced by the subtlety and temptation of Satan, sinned in eating the forbidden fruit. This their sin God was pleased, according to his wise and holy counsel, to permit, having purpose to order it to his own glory. Now section 2. By this sin they fell from their original righteousness and communion with God, and so became dead in sin, and wholly defiled in all the parts and faculties of soul and body. Our first parents are, of course, Adam and Eve. Now, I know very well that many Christians today question the existence of Adam and Eve and view their story as more of a parable than history. However, and as we'll soon see, this creates all sorts of problems since the Apostle Paul compares and contrasts Adam with the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that becomes meaningless if Adam never really existed. Back in chapter 4, the chapter dealing with creation, at section 2, the confession describes what life was like for Adam and Eve before they sinned. They were happy in their communion with God and had dominion over the creatures. Happy in their communion with God. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Living in a world without the corrupting effects of sin. A world in which there is no shame, no guilt, no sorrow, no fear. Now we're told, they fell from their original righteousness and communion with God. Righteousness speaks of right thinking, right attitudes, right behaviour. Before the fall, their wills and desires were in harmony with God's will and desires. Their love for one another was pure and selfless. So how did it all go wrong? Our first parents, being seduced by the subtlety and temptation of Satan, sinned in eating the forbidden fruit. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, tell us that the Lord God had said to Adam, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now we move on into Genesis 3, and we read that Satan, in the form of a serpent, persuaded Adam and Eve that God was lying that they would not die. Indeed, by eating, they would become like God. They chose to believe Satan. And consequently, as the confession says, they became dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. Now, here's a question that's frequently asked. Why did God not stop sin entering the world? Well, the confession has an answer. There's this sin God was pleased, according to his wise and holy counsel, to permit, having purpose to order it to his own glory. This takes us back to what we said in chapter 3 about God's eternal decree, that 
from all eternity, God did, by the wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, ordain whatever comes to pass. If that were not so, well, God would be in the dark about the future as much as we are. Now, can you imagine the Lord God wondering whether or not Adam and Eve would obey his command not to eat the forbidden fruit? Uh, Can you picture the creator God watching Adam and Eve as the serpent speaks to them uh, and just hoping, crossing his fingers as it were, that they'll not listen to his lies and, and, and walk away? Well, that's absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? Not only did God permit them to sin, it was part of his plan. Everything about God is geared towards his glory, and he obtains greater glory in redeeming rebellious humanity than if humanity had never rebelled at all. If Adam and Eve had not sinned, there would be no opportunity for God to reveal the extent of his love and mercy. The consequence of eating the forbidden fruit is that they became dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. In other words, every aspect of their humanity was affected. Their relationship with each other fell apart and their communion with God ended. When Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 talks about them hearing the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, The impression is that this was a familiar sound, a sound that used to fill them with joy, but not anymore. They heard the sound of the Lord God and they hid. They hid. Having acquired the knowledge of good and evil, they know that they have done wrong and they're ashamed. It's spiritual death and it will eventually lead to physical death. We can describe the effect of sin upon Adam and Eve's relationship as the horizontal consequence of sin and the breakdown in their communication with God as the upward consequence of sin. There is also a downward consequence down through the generations. Listen to section 3. They being the root of all mankind the guilt of this sin was imputed, and the same death and sin and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity, descending from them by ordinary generation. Adam and Eve's rebellion didn't just affect them and their relationship with each other with God, it has affected every human being ever since. It works its way downward through the generations. This is what the Apostle Paul teaches in Romans chapter 5. In Romans 5 verse 12, Paul wants to say that it is through the one man, the Lord Jesus Christ, that believers are saved from the wrath of God. He says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned, and then jumping to verse 18, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. One man's sin opened the door to judgment and death. Another man's righteousness brought justification and life. The one man who opened the door to sin and death was Adam. And in that one act of rebellion, the whole human race sinned. Verse 19, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. You see, as the first human being, Adam represented all humanity. He was the root of all mankind. And if the root is poisoned, then the whole tree is poisoned. We're all connected to Adam and therefore to his sin and his fate. Okay, at first sight, that might seem unfair. Why should one man's sin affect us all? Yeah, of course, we are quite happy to accept the righteousness of one man on our behalf, benefiting us all, the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. We're all affected by Adam's sin. 
and the proof of this is death. Verse 12, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. Death, the punishment for sin, comes to us all. From this flows the doctrine of original sin. That means that we are all sinners from our beginning, from our origins. I wonder, do you find that idea abhorrent? Do you want to believe that human beings are perfect and sinless at their birth and just somehow go astray due to social deprivation or a bad example at home? But you see, that argument doesn't explain, well, why do we choose to follow the bad examples rather than the good examples? And anyway, you know fine well, children do not need to be taught how to lie or cheat or be selfish or proud. Section 4 explains how original sin has affected every aspect of our humanity and is the cause of all our actual sins. From this original corruption, whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled and made opposite to all good and wholly inclined to all evil, do proceed all actual transgressions. You've often heard me say, haven't you, that we are not sinners because we sin, we sin because we are sinners. Our actual sins, the lies, the pride, the greed, the selfishness, they flow from the fact that we are sinners from birth, spiritually dead and needing to be born again of God's Holy Spirit. And this is still true for us even when we become a Christian. Section 5. This corruption of nature during this life doth remain in those that are regenerated. And although it be through Christ pardoned and mortified, yet both itself and all the emotions thereof are truly and properly sin. Now, there are those within the church who believe that it is actually possible to reach a state of sinlessness in this life. The confession denies that. In Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul describes his struggle with sin. And he says in chapter 7, verse 18, For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. And he goes on to talk about the war that is waging within him. You see, my friends, this is what distinguishes a believer from a non-believer. Not that we no longer sin, but that there is an inner war going on. We hate our moral failures. We war against our sin. We cry out to the Lord, not just for forgiveness, but for the power to overcome temptation. That's the difference. Well, chapter 6 ends with this stark truth, that sin renders us guilty in the sight of a holy God and deserving of his wrath. Section 6. Every sin, both original and actual, being a transgression of the righteous law of God, and contrary thereunto, doth in its own nature bring guilt upon the sinner, whereby he is bound over to the wrath of God and curse of the law, and so made subject to death with all miseries spiritual, temporal, and eternal. Now, just think about the misery sin has inflicted upon the planet, the pollution, the environmental disasters caused by our greed. And then, being more specific to us personally, think about the misery you have inflicted on others by your sin. The wounds caused by hurtful words, the cost to others of your selfish actions. Now see the misery that sin has brought to your door. The misery of feeling far from God. The misery of not being able to pray. The, uh, the Bible being a closed book. And then translate that into the misery of everlasting separation from God and the hopelessness 
of hell.